the Cabinet concluded that because of the extraordinary booster campaign, together with the way the public have responded to the Plan B, the Cabinet concluded that once regulations lapse, the Government will no longer mandate the wearing of face masks anywhere. <laughs> Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker from, from, tomorrow, from tomorrow we will no longer require face masks in classrooms and the Department, and the Department for Education will shortly remove national guidance uh, on their use in communal areas. In the country at large, we will continue to suggest the use of face coverings in enclosed or crowded spaces, particularly when you come into contact with people you don't normally meet. But we will trust the judgment of the British people and no longer criminalise anyone who chooses not to wear one. The Government will also ease restrictions further on visits to care homes, and my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, will set out plans in the coming days. Mr. Speaker, as we return to Plan A, the House will know that some measures still remain, including those on self isolation. In particular, it is still a legal requirement for those who have tested positive for COVID to self-isolate. On Monday, we reduced the isolation period to five full days with two negative tests, and there will soon come a time when we can remove the legal requirement to self-isolate altogether, just as we don't place legal obligations on people to isolate if they have flu. As COVID becomes endemic, we will need to replace legal requirements with advice and guidance urging people with the virus to be careful and considerate of others. The self-isolation regulations expire on the 24th of March, at which point I very much expect not to renew them. Indeed, were the data to allow, I would like to seek a vote in this House to bring that date forwards. Now, hospitalisation rates in the UK have just about levelled off, but in the United States, they're still increasing, and this is a concern. In the United Kingdom, it's bad enough. We've got six million people waiting for elective treatment, so the sooner we can get all this COVID stuff out of the way, the better. But in the States, there are quite significant challenges in most areas now for hospitalisations, and people requiring urgent care are simply not getting it. And, of course, sometimes it's just going to be too late unfortunately we don't have definitive answers on that so what seems to be happening is we've got this mass of people with comorbidities in the states and then we've got this massive overlay of omicron on top of it and that omicron is just the extra few percent that is tipping people with those comorbidities into hospitalization whether it's cerebral vascular disease heart disease diabetes renal failure chronic lung disease chronic hypertension chronic obesity whatever it is it's just tipping them over the edge. So it seems like this is exacerbating the massive comorbidities in the States. So what she's saying is we've got all these comorbidities in the States, people that are on the margins of getting sick anyway. And if they get COVID, just that, it, it, what she's saying really is it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's the last thing that actually tips people over into hospital because of the large amount of comorbidities. And the point is, everyone's getting COVID now, so this is causing a massive surge of admissions. There are infections, but that's causing a massive surge of admissions. So people with high blood pressure are more likely to get serious disease, were more likely to die. The next one was obesity. People that were overweight were more likely to get serious disease and more likely to die. And the third one was diabetes. Diabetes mellitus, or so-called sugar diabetes. And other comorbidities were coronary artery disease, poor circulation to the heart muscle, heart failure, where the heart's not pumping out enough blood to meet the metabolic demands of the body, asthma and uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, patients with cancers was another one, kidney disease, liver disease, people who had had or had were living with HIV and people who had had uh, transplants. So a comorbidity is a coexisting disease. Morbidity is really another term for disease. Um, in, in America, the highest, the greatest comorbidities that we have as we age are hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, cancer, 
uh, now renal disease is um, starting to increase because of the high protein diets people are eating. And all the other diseases that I've mentioned earlier are, can also be associated with renal disease. Uh, Alzheimer's is also a comorbidity, so is lung disease. And obesity, we're finding, is also a comorbidity that is present, uh, interestingly, in the younger population. You know, initially when coronavirus uh, statistics came out, we were saying that younger people have a lesser chance of death than the elderly. But what we're finding is more younger people are dying, especially in regions of America where childhood obesity is high. So obesity is definitely also a comorbidity and America is reft with obesity. <clears throat> so what, what uh, the data is showing is that people that are more likely to die from coronavirus uh, infection have at least one comorbidity. In New York, their data showed that 86% of deaths uh, in New York City from coronavirus um, had uh, were, were in patients that had at least one comorbidity, uh, and these are as follows. Hypertension, diabetes, um, <clears throat> renal disease, uh, coronary artery disease, dementia, COPD, which is emphysema, cancer, atrial fibrillation, and heart failure. Add obesity to that list, and um, and, and then we pretty much have uh, most of the comorbidities that Americans have today. Now, <clears throat> what, why are younger people that are apparently healthy dying also of coronavirus, even Americans that are not um, obese? Well, it's, it's an interesting uh, concept, this comorbidity concept. I kind of see it as, you know, in, before a disease manifests, we have to make certain choices in order to um, end up with that disease. So <clears throat> the building blocks of disease really are our lifestyle choices. If we choose to eat saturated fat, if we choose to drink alcohol, if we choose to eat meat and dairy in high quantities, if we choose not to exercise, those are all building blocks to develop a disease. Now there are also building blocks to develop health. And those building blocks are a whole food plant-based diet, um, a, a daily exercise, uh, learning how to manage your stress, learning how to reduce your stress, uh, living a more balanced life. Sounds good, doesn't it? So people that live in the latter way, those building blocks actually create health. So what, why are we living uh, in ways that create comorbidities? I think it's a lot of it is habit. A lot of it is the normalization in our society of bad habits or unhealthy habits. And one of the things that is not really talked about is the, the basic definition of health. Health is not just an absence of disease. Health is... Um, uh, having an optimal body that's aligned with itself where all systems are working collaboratively together to maximize health. So that's really what we want. We want optimal health. So what's happening in the younger generation is that even though they don't have a disease yet, the habits that they are living with, the lifestyle choices they are living with, uh, are causing less than optimal conditions in their body and the body systems are required to work optimally in order to fight infection, in order to have a strong immune response, in order to um, have a healthy liver, which is the first responder in any immune response. So if the younger generation uh, has been creating these building blocks towards a comorbidity or towards disease, um, and just because the disease hasn't manifested yet doesn't mean that their body is healthy. So what we're finding is with this coronavirus, if you choose those building blocks that will result over time in a comorbidity, you are more likely to have a serious infection and you have an increased likelihood of death with coronavirus. 
So I just wanted to make sure that you understood this whole concept of a comorbidity and also understood that there is so much you can do. There are so many other choices you can make other than what are normalized in our society. Just because we normalize choices that are unhealthy doesn't make them right. How does Omicron differ from earlier virus variants? Omicron is, is pretty different from previous variants. Um, compared to the original version of the virus, its genome carries mutations in more than 50 places. Um, around three dozen of them affect what's called the spike protein, um, that structure that juts out all over the place on the virus's surface. And the thing is, alterations to it can have major effects in a couple of different ways. Um, first, because the spike protein is what SARS-CoV-2 uses to dock onto cells and infect them. So mutations in it can potentially make Omicron even better at that. And second, because the spike protein is the target of many of the COVID vaccines that we've developed. Um, its structure plays a key role in training the immune system to recognize future virus infections. So if the spike changes too radically in a new variant, then defenses like antibodies might no longer recognize it as well, or, or even at all. It could start evading immunity. We're still learning about the ways that Omicron differs from previous versions of the virus, but, but skyrocketing cases in many countries clearly make it the most infectious variant that we've seen so far. Um, scientists think that, that like Delta, some of Omicron's increased transmissibility probably has to do with spike mutations that help make it better at grabbing on to the membrane receptors that provide an entryway into a cell's interior. Um, another hypothesis holds that people infected with Omicron might be shedding more of the virus since some studies show that it seems to replicate massively and rapidly and closer to your mouth and nose. So in the respiratory tract, above the lungs and, and less in the lungs themselves. Uh, by the way, that might also be a big reason why Omicron is proving less deadly than its cousins, because in a lot of people, it seems to spare the lungs. But at the top of the list of differences between Omicron and other variants is how good it seems to be at dodging immune defenses in both people who've been vaccinated and in those who've recovered from previous bouts uh, with other variants. Delta could evade immune defenses as well, but, but not nearly as well as Omicron seems to be able to. And if defenses no longer mostly protect people from infection, experts say, then that could help explain a lot of the steep rise in cases that we're seeing, even in heavily vaccinated countries. Uh, but that doesn't mean that vaccines or previous infections provide no protection at all. Uh, people who are unvaccinated and have never had COVID still make up the majority of patients in ICUs. So even with Omicron, Previous infection or vaccination appears to help prevent severe infection in most people, especially if they've received a booster shot. 